Good morning, church. Welcome. We just want to invite you to start us off with uh, some praise and worship as we start the service. Um, but before we do, let's take some time to kind of just settle our hearts and clear our minds um, so that we can just focus on God uh, today. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just ask that you um, come into our places of worship, Lord, um, that you just move your spirit through each and every one of us um, so that we can give you the worship and praise that you deserve. Um, we thank you for everything that you've done for this week, um, and we just want to give back to you our um what we've earned, Lord, that we couldn't have done it without you, um, God. Um, so as we sing these next few songs, I pray that you just um, rejoice um, in what you hear. And I pray that you just speak over Pastor Scott and to um, guide our leaders, Lord, of uh, this country, of wherever we work, Lord. Uh, that they know uh, what it means to fear the Lord. Um, so we thank you and we pray all of these in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So I bring to you today's call to worship. It comes from Psalms 145, verses 8 to 9, and 18 to verse 21. It says, The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all, and his mercy is over all that he has made. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desires of those who fear him. He also hears the cries, their cries and saves them. The Lord preserves all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. My mouth will speak the praise of the Lord and let all flesh bless his holy name forever and ever. So wherever you are, let's all just stand and give praise to our Lord. <clears throat>
Just 
Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, it's all about You. God, all glory goes to You. You have life in Yourself, and You do fulfill us, Lord. God, You give and take away, and we can still say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. God, You are amazing, Lord. You are the bread of life that sustains us, not in material things, although You bless us with those things, but with Yourself. And God, You say that if we have You, we have life. We have life both here, now, and forever, Lord. God, You did it all for us. We don't deserve this. God, we rebel against You, the goodness of You, the life of You, but You still came and poured Yourself out for us. It is a scandal of grace to see that, Lord, that You poured Your life out for us, for people who are sinners and don't deserve it. You got on that cross and You gave Your life so that we would be free. And Lord, that's Your love for us. The scandal of grace, God. It's a gift we don't deserve that You freely bestowed on us. But wow, the Savior of the world who is perfect, who's God Himself, gave His life for us. And You are forever the hope in our heart, Lord, that You love us and You've joined us to You in this spiritual union, God, forever. And God, I just pray that every day we will hold on to You and bring You honor and glory and praise and worship, Lord. God, thank You for calling us to Yourself. Your steadfast love goes on and on and on. You are the Creator God that gives us everything we need for life and godliness, Lord. God, bless our time today. Thank You for the worship and psalm. And bless the time in Your words. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Today we're going to pick up again in John chapter 6. John chapter 6, where we've been, starting in verse 41, actually. 40 we did last time, and we'll start in verse 41. So if you have your Bible at home, open it up, read along, and then also look on the screen. Starting in John 6, verse 41. So the Jews grumbled about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say, I have come down from heaven? Jesus answered them, do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. It is written in the prophets, and they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except he who is from God. He has seen the Father. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that comes down for heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. One may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that comes down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. The Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day, for my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father has sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever feeds on me, he also will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like the bread the fathers ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. Jesus said these things in the synagogue as he taught at Capernaum. Here we are today, uh, thanks to Eric for uh, preaching to us last week, and, and now we're going to pick up again here in John chapter 6. We're in the middle of this section where Jesus is comparing himself to bread, bread that gives us life, that comes down from heaven. And so uh, if, if you remember a few times ago, Jesus had done this wonderful miracle where he took bread and multiplied it. 
Well, it's pointing to himself as the ultimate bread of life to give us eternal life, new life, forgiveness of sins, and life unto God. And so uh, here we are now in John 6, and he's explaining to the Jewish people in a synagogue, Jewish leaders, and there might be some uh, lay people in there as well. He's explaining to them that he is life in himself and that he is bread that comes down from heaven. Obviously, he's talking symbolically, symbolically. However, the Jews are having a tough time with his saying. They, they, they're still wondering, who this, who does this guy think he is? Uh, is he the Messiah? He's a miracle worker. Who is this man? So let's take a look. Our first point today is for us, we're going to see we need to humbly submit to God. And this is something the Jews need to do. They need to humbly submit to God because if they do, they will understand that Jesus is God's way of salvation, the Father's way. Jesus the Son is the way to God, the way to be saved eternally. And so uh, we're, we're, we're going to look at this point here, starting in verse 41. It says, the Jews grumbled about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say, I've come down from heaven? So they're very skeptical. You know, they think this guy is just some guy who's come from an earthly birth, which is halfway true. He did come from his mother, Mary, but Joseph wasn't actually his real biological father. We know it was a divine, uh, the, the birth of Jesus was divine. It was, we call it the immaculate conception from God himself, the Holy Spirit overshadowing Mary and giving her birth to this child. But they, they all they see is, hey, I, we know this guy's family. We know Joseph. We know Mary. Who is this guy? Who does he think he is? He's now proclaiming these wonderful things, calling himself equal with God. Uh, I don't know if they can deny the miracles because he's doing things that are amazing, but his teaching, he's pointing to himself as God's gift to them from heaven. They're like, well, how can this guy come down from heaven? He's from earth and we know he is. And so they're grumbling and they're upset and they're, they're very skeptical. And so Jesus has to answer them. He answered them, do not grumble among yourselves. No one, verse 44, can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And I will raise him up on the last day. I will raise him up. I think I left off that last phrase. I will raise him up on the last day. Very interesting. Some scholars point out that as Jesus is comparing himself to bread, and there's also this comparison in this passage to manna. And if you remember what manna is, in the Old Testament, uh, with the Israelites, when they're out in the wilderness, God provided for them in the desert this sort of corn flaky, honey tasting uh, food that God sort of provided from heaven miraculously on the ground. And what's interesting is that as the Jews are grumbling about Jesus, the bread from heaven, it reminisces us of the time when the Israelites were grumbling in the wilderness because they didn't think God was taking care of them very well, even though God was giving them food. They grumbled about God's work back then, and these new Jews here today in this passage are grumbling. They're not accepting Jesus himself as God's Messiah, God's answer for the world, for all the problems of the world, to life and forgiveness of sins. They're, they're grumbling. And so Jesus just calls them out and says, stop grumbling, stop grumbling. And then he says something interesting. He says, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And I will raise him up on the last day. I will raise him up at, on the last day. And so, scholar points out that maybe what Jesus is doing here is that he's, he's going to these people. He's going to the Jews. And basically, they're trying to ascertain, to measure him, to test him, to, to try to observe on their own ability, is this guy from God or not? Um, I'm skeptical. I'm questioning. And basically, Jesus is just calling out and says, look, you won't be able to do that. You cannot, in, in and of yourselves, figure out who I am unless the Father draws you to me. This goes back to last time, if you guys want to look back earlier in, in the passage. Jesus says, no one can come. No, he, says, he said this today. He said, last time, all that the Father has given me will come to me. And he who comes to me, I will not cast out. So the Father has previously from eternity past, selected those who belong to Jesus. He has already selected his sheep, his people, and he says, all that the Father has given to me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will not cast out. 
Now, somebody say, wow, so it's a done deal. Like, I can't come to Jesus because I'm not one of those who are God selected. But Jesus also has the other side, this great mystery of God's sovereign choice of who belongs to him. Yet, from our side, from human responsibility, Jesus says, come to me. There's nothing holding you back. Come to me. Come to me. Whoever comes to me in faith and says, Jesus, you are my king. You're my savior. You, you've died for my sins. You've covered me before a holy God. And of course, the cross hasn't happened yet, but it's all pointing to Jesus and his salvation for the world, eternal life. And that's what Jesus is telling them. But Jesus says, come to me. Come to me. I will not cast you out. And now he's kind of doing the inverse of this in verse 44. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. So the Father has to work in your heart. And we call this now in the church, the Holy Spirit has to open your eyes, bring your heart alive so that you can see God, the work of God. But there is still the responsibility of us to step forward and put our faith and our trust in who Jesus is and His life given to us. All that the Father gives to me will come to me. And he who comes to me, I will never cast out. He who comes, come to Jesus. This is what Jesus is saying. For your salvation, to forgive you of sins, to bring you to God forever, for eternal life, you must come to the Father. At the same time, as we look at these passages, it is only the Father, what we would say the Holy Spirit, drawing us to Him. He has to illuminate our hearts and our minds and open our eyes to the gospel, to the good news of Jesus. It's God's sovereign work. It's God's sovereign work. Now, again, we are not saying it's like, oh, I'm somehow I'm pulled against my will to go to God. No, when we hear someone tell us about Jesus, and for a lot of us, this has happened in our life as we thought about it, as we prayed about it, Maybe it was a pretty quick decision for you. Maybe it was over time, but you said, yes, I want Jesus. So this is no one's being pulled against their will. This is, I love Jesus. He loves me. Look what he did for me. He gave me eternal life, even though I don't deserve it. And so going back to our first point here, number one, humbly submit to God. What Jesus is challenging them to do is humbly come before God and say, God, I want to know who you are. I want to seek you out. I want to understand what you're trying to tell me for my life. And the Jews, a lot of the Jews were not being humble and surrendering their hearts to God. They were prideful. A lot of the Pharisees, we know this. A lot of the leaders were prideful. They want to be seen as God. They want to be seen as awesome and have people applaud them. They were not humbly submitting to God. Even though they claimed to do that all the time, they actually were not doing that. And So they have to humbly submit to God as we all do. As we all do, we've got to humbly submit to God. God says, Jesus says, I will raise you up on the last day. I will raise you up on the last day. I will bring you to life. Even though you may die in this world, I will bring you to life. So they're grumbling and Jesus is, is rebuking them. Come to me. Come to me. He has the power to give life. Humbly submit to God's word. Verse 45, it is written in the prophets, and they will be taught by God. Everyone has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Everyone who learns, has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. So what, what, what I, you know, Jesus is saying, look, if you really revere the Old Testament prophets, if you really revere them and you love them and you love God's word and you're humbly submitting to God and you trust in God, you're being taught by God. The scriptures, the Old Testament scriptures, what they had is from God. You will believe in Jesus as well. Now we know, again, being taught by God is God himself illuminating people's hearts to understand him. And, and Jesus is drawing on an Old Testament passage from Isaiah. The prophets themselves talk about a time when God will write the law of God in our hearts. He will, he will really move into our hearts and take out our heart of stone and put in a heart of flesh, he will transform us so that we'll truly love and desire to follow Jesus. And so, Jews, and for us today, if we really want to know God, if we want to come to God, if we want to understand what, what who He is and what He means for our lives, we have to humbly submit to His Word and what He's revealed. 
And, and he's going to these Jews. If you've heard and learned from the Father, you have come to me. And what, he's, what Jesus is saying is, a lot of you truly are not trusting in God. You're not really learning from the Father. You're not hearing from Him. As we saw a few times ago, a lot of the Jews, they think in just doing this sort of academic study of Scripture, they'll somehow get eternal life by putting together all the rules and trying to figure out the system of the Old Testament. And he says, you're missing the person of God and ultimately the person of Christ. It's not because you obey a lot of rules, which is impossible because we're sinners, to somehow earn your way to God. It's impossible to go to a perfect, holy God. And their hearts were far from him because they were doing it for themselves and not from God, not for God. You think that studying scripture, you find eternal life. That's not true. It's I submit to God. Yes, I want to obey God, but it comes from a heart that's submitted to him, that he's all that I have. Only through his sacrifice can I believe in him. Everyone's heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Jesus is saying, look, this is hard to understand. It may be, and the reason is because you don't want to truly hear, but if you truly want to follow God and you want to serve Him, you will come to me because I am the manifestation of God in the flesh. In the flesh. And he goes on in verse 46 and he says this, not that anyone has seen the Father except he who who is from God, he has seen the Father. So, So... if people have learned from the Father and heard from the Father, Jesus is the better, better revelation because he's actually been with Jesus, a, a God the Father. The Son, Jesus, has been with the Father, and he can now come and properly reveal who the Father is. The Old Testament scriptures were pointing ahead to Jesus, and they were illuminating us to who God is. But even better now, Jesus is on the scene, and he's directly from the Father. He's seen the Father. And so he can properly tell us about God because he's been with the Father and he's God himself. And Jesus, of course, makes this point all the time. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. If you have me, you have the Father. If you believe in the Father, you have me. He reveals to them the Father. One commentator says this, these people, they are taught by God if and only if they truly hear Jesus. And Jesus has been making that clear throughout our study today and throughout weeks we've been looking at this. If they want to be taught by God, then they are truly listening to Jesus. Jesus is God's revelation. So it's this humble submission to God. that I really want to know you, God. Give me the understanding of who you are. And if that's true, Jesus will be accepted by us as our way of salvation. He is the way of the truth and the life, he'll say later. The only way to God. So we have to humbly submit to him. Second point I want you to focus on today as we humbly come to him, humbly believe in God, we humbly will accept Jesus through our belief in God as God's revelation to us is Jesus. Number two, today I want you to remember these phrase, this phrase, feast on Jesus. Feast on Jesus. And so now Jesus turns to his, his discussion here about him being the bread of life. And so let's take a look. Verse 47. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that comes down, the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. Whoever believes in me has eternal life. He's been saying that. It's simple. I have life. And I can give you eternal life. I am the bread of life. And he looks at the Jews and he says, your fathers ate manna in the wilderness, but they died. So it's self-evident that all those Jews from back then, they're, they're not living eternally right now, in a sense. In a sense, right? They physically died. So that manna could not sustain them. Now, he, in some ways he's talking symbolically. But he says, my bread is eternal. You may not die. And what he's really saying is that those who truly believed in God and ate the manna back then, that manna was a type of Jesus. It was pointing forward to him. And Jesus now is the fullest revelation of this bread. And he says, you come to me, you will not die. And so he goes on in verse 51. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. He will have eternal life. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is 
my flesh. He tacks on something very interesting at the end of verse 51. I'm the bread of life, but the bread of my life is my flesh. It's my flesh. I believe this is the first time he said this about his flesh giving life. His flesh. Sort of a strange statement. Now, as church, many of us know, this is talking about, and it's pointing forward to, he's giving his life, his flesh. The cross, the sacrificial lamb, his blood is spilled out, his body broken, his flesh given to pay for the penalty due me, death. My sins have separated me from a holy God. Jesus giving his flesh. But put yourself in those people's shoes. They're, they're listening to Jesus and they're saying, okay, what is this guy talking about? He's the bread of life. And now he's saying, my bread is my flesh. I'm like, ooh, what does he mean by that? And, and we know this here in verse two to, for 52. The Jews then disputed among themselves saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? Now, I hope they're not thinking that He's being literal here, like I'm going to start skinning off my flesh and just tossing that to you. That would be gross. And hopefully they're thinking like it is symbolic, but they may be wondering in what way is this symbolic? He's giving us flesh to eat. Giving flesh. Later on, Jesus will institute the Lord's Supper. Of course, it's one of the main things we do in the church that God's given us. And now we have 2,000 years of church history where we celebrate Christ's body being broken for us, represented in the bread as symbolic uh, uh, remembrance of Jesus, and then his, his blood being represented in the cup that we drink, the symbolic uh, 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 ordinance, we call it. This, this, we do this in memory, this act of what Jesus did. And Jesus is speaking symbolically here, but remember, this is, again, this, this hasn't happened yet. The Jews are just thinking, whoa, he's talking about flesh, woo. Now, if you're a Jewish person, this is gross, and this is kind of nasty, and you're, this is breaking God's law. God's law said in the Old Testament, you cannot drink blood that is not allowed in the law. You're breaking the law. Uh, you're, you're, in fact, it goes back to Noah as well. Life is in the blood. Uh, there's something special about the blood. Um, you cannot drink blood. You can't drink it. You, 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 you can't have anything to do with that. That's a sinful thing to do. It's scandalous. And, and now, but now Jesus is saying, you, you gotta eat my flesh. So you're like, wow, this is, what, what is he trying to, is he trying to uh, get under our skin and annoy us? Uh, he's trying to be this radical. It's weird. And, and, you know, if you think about it again, you're thinking he's gonna give us his flesh. Uh, you know, it, 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 it's kind of a strange uh, statement. But again, we know Jesus is not talking, of course, about cannibalism. We're not eating. We're not eating Jesus literally. Of course, that would go be sort of murderous and uh, it would go against human dignity. We don't do that. But let's, let's, let's go on to what Jesus says here. Verse 53, so Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you that unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink His blood, just stop there. So now He's talking about His flesh. Now He says, if you drink, if you don't drink my blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I'll raise him up on the last day, for my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. So now if you're tracking along with him, he's like, you know, you're talking, he's symbolically talking about his flesh, but he goes on, Jesus goes on. It gets worse. You eat my flesh and drink my blood, which just is, again, kind of re repulsive to us, kind of gross. Uh, you, what are you, what are you, what are you talking about? Like, you're not going to kill yourself and just give your blood, and it won't. It only goes so far, if that's literal. Um, I, I tell you what, blood is a strange thing, right? And I hope don't get too gross. I, I personally sometimes I don't know if I could be a good doctor because sometimes when I get the sight of blood, I get a little queasy in my stomach. It just does something to me. Um, if I see people bleeding, or you know, I, I one time I remember I went to a science museum and I saw this video of they were doing an autopsy, autopsy on somebody. And it about made me sick. I couldn't, you know, I know people pass out when they see blood. It's, it's not a pleasant thing for most people. This, this thought of blood and it, it's, it's, and then he's talking about drinking his blood. You're like, what? It, 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 it's, it's repulsive. Um, that's why some people even, 
you know, um, th they like their meat very well done. They, they don't even want a little pink in it because they think the thing's still alive on there. They just can't take it, right? Um, give me that hamburger well done, that steak, no medium rare or rare here. It's, it's well done because, you know, I, I used to serve in restaurants a lot when I was younger and people, people would say, Hey, that, that, that meat, that cow's meat is still mooing at me. It's still alive because it's, it's got the blood and, you know, and, and there's some, there's some biblical precedent, as we said, in the law of, the law of God, that we weren't supposed to eat, drink blood. And now, so we sang a song about a scandal. Here's a scandal that is coming to these people. He's talking about drinking his blood. I, like, what in the world does he mean about this? What does he mean? Jesus is very clear. Unless you drink my blood, unless you eat my flesh, you, have, you don't have eternal life in you. Is obviously, again, speaking symbolically. Speaking symbolically. And we, this is where we differ from the Roman Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic Church believes the Lord's Supper literally becomes Christ's body and his real blood. It doesn't, we don't see the change, but it actually becomes that. Of course, we reject that because that would be sort of a type of cannibalism, a type of, uh, uh, murder in some ways. And, and, and we don't, we, we, we see it as simply a symbol. And that's what Jesus is doing here. One commentator said something very interesting. I, I really like. When we eat food and when we drink uh, a liquid, it's a very real experience for us. So, you know, it's not something, you know, we don't get food just through our minds or it's abstract, like I, I have to eat. It's out there. And I just look at the food and somehow it nourishes me. You know, this the whole experience of eating is very real for us. So you smell the food, you know, and when you're, if you're in a different room of your house and somebody in your house, maybe your mom's cooking something good and you're like, wow, it comes wafting into your room. Well, I'm ready to eat. You know, I'm, I am hungry. You smell that good smell. Um, it affects you. And, and, uh, you know, if you're really hungry, you feel that urge in your body to go eat something good. You taste it. You, you know, you chew it. And then it goes down into your body. It comes into your very body. And the food, like, becomes part of you. So the food fills up your, 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 your veins and your, helps to rebuild cells, gives you nourishment and strength and vitamins. And it's a very real, a real experience. Um, you know, in like wealthy societies like ours, you know, you even have people who just love the whole idea of, of food. They're, you call them foodies. You know, I just, they, we can't do it much now in the pandemic, but they love to go to different restaurants and, or cook different recipes. Food is a very, uh, real experience for, for a lot of people. A lot of people like this whole idea of, of the experiential partaking of, of food. And, and I even remember, I think it was, just recently, like last week, I just remember being so hungry. And this, when you see a satisfying, you know, Parmesan encrusted chicken, you know, you're just, let me sink my teeth into it. If you're very, doing some yard work outside and you, you want liquid, you want it to satisfy, it satisfies you. It satisfies you. But this is a good way to think of what Jesus has done for us. If you, if you do not drink of Jesus and do not feast on him, you can't be satisfied. And of course, Jesus, again, is not talking about material stuff. The food and drink that we consume points to this. He's better than this. He satisfies our deepest need of our soul, and that is to be in a relationship with God. That's how God designed us. And we need to get back to Him. And Jesus is the only person who can bring us back to glorifying God in our lives and knowing Him and understanding His love for us that only his work for us can do that. And so Jesus is by his life and his death for us and covering us in our sins, his resurrection, the Holy Spirit coming to live inside of us, and then us walking with God, us walking every day with God. We have brought Jesus into us. We have tasted him. We feed on him. And we'll talk more about this. We feed on him hopefully every day actively in our in study of the word and prayer. But it's this, I feast on Jesus. I love him and I want to know him through his word and through the community of the church together as we follow him together. I'm, I'm thinking about him and it's very, it's, it's not just Jesus is out there somewhere and he's just some kind of idea for me. No, he's, he's part of me and I, I feast on him. And again, that's why I, this wonderful, uh, picture of the Lord's Supper, it's very real to us. We're literally eating a little, you know, it's kind of gross now. It's a little wafer. You know, we could do better than that, right? A full loaf of bread. But it's this little wafer and this food we eat. It's because we, we want to experience and just 
let it touch our senses. What we're trying to remember, what Jesus has done, the symbol of this Lord's Supper, in some ways helps us to draw near to Christ. His flesh is true blood, and uh, is true true flesh. His flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. He is not saying that you have to literally do this. Come and drink my blood. He's not saying that. But he's saying, for very real life, me with you, you with me, for eternity, you have to feast on me. It's a wonderful analogy. What, what a great analogy that he's providing for us. As real as food and drink is to us, we need it every day. He's greater and he's in us. Verse 56, whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. And I love this verse by Jesus. Not only is he uh, tell us to feast on him, but he says, I'm going to abide in you and, and you and me. So just like food goes into you and becomes a part of you and goes into your bloodstream and fills you up, it's like Jesus now through the Holy Spirit actually becomes one with us. He abides in us, he remains in us, and we in him. Now, we, theologians call this the, the, the union with Christ. It's the spiritual union we have, the Holy Spirit connecting me to Jesus. I abide in him, and he abides in me. And, and this is another analogy in Scripture where Jesus gives us the marriage analogy. Jesus becomes one with us. And this is another take on that. It's food coming into us, and he becomes one with us. Oh, what a beautiful picture. He satisfies me at my deepest soul. He's residing in me, and I am unified to him. And so, you know, I like to say, like, spiritually, it's like his blood now is running in us. He's part of us. And he will never let us go. He will never cast us out. He's always with us, and he will certainly bring us home uh, forever. And so he goes on now in verse 57, as the living Father has sent me, I live because of the Father. So whoever feeds on me, he will also live because of me. The living Father, who has life in himself, has given life to his Son, and then he brings that Son, that life to us. And we will live. Beautiful picture of this connection to God. The Father has life. He gives to the Son. The Son gives to us. And we come into this family of the Trinity. The Holy Spirit connects us. We, we, we live. We live. We have life. True life at the very deepest sense. I know God now. He knows me. And I'll be with him forever, glorifying him. He'll love me forever. He has life. So this is kind of this wonderful, I don't know, almost like an assembly line, this order. Life flows from the Father to the Son and to us, according to this verse. We're caught up into this. And I think it doesn't, Jesus doesn't say this here, but I just want to tack on. Then our job is in this life, we're to pass that bread on to others. We're supposed to spread, spread uh, life as well. Just as Jesus has given it to us individually and as a church, we then go pass this life on to others. It's the call of the church. And lastly, in the last two verses, Jesus sums up and he says, This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like the bread the fathers ate and died. So stop there. I am different. I am what the Old Testament always pointed to. You will always be satisfied with me, Jesus is saying. It's not like the Old Testament. I'm better. I will give you eternal life. Whoever feeds on this bread, Jesus himself will live forever. And Jesus said these things in the synagogue as he taught at Capernaum. So right there, to the Jews in the synagogue, he's clearly telling them, I am the bread of life. I'm better than who you revere, Moses, and the manna. I'm better. I am better than that. I, I'm, just, I'm just enthralled with this analogy. What a beautiful analogy of us feasting on Jesus. So a couple application points. Number one, at the beginning, the first part we looked at, you have to surrender to God's word. The problem was that the Jews, for a lot of them, were just resisting Jesus. Because you know why? They were resisting God the Father in the first place. They weren't humbly submitting to his word and living a life of faith and repentance. They weren't surrendering to God. And so in our lives, if we want to be right with God, first of all, we have to bend our knee to God and ultimately his revelation, Jesus Christ, that Jesus paid for my sins. He's the only savior of the world. He's the only one who can take away our sins. 
to make us right with a holy God. Nobody else has done that. And Jesus has resurrected to live forever and to raise me up too if I trust him and believe that he's my Lord and Savior. We have to surrender to Christ. And then he's given us his word, what we're studying today, his word. Continue to humbly submit to God and what he's told us, his very words in scripture. And we can follow Christ. So we got to constantly, humbly surrender to God's word. Don't be like the Jews or some of the Jews who resisted and kept resisting and were prideful. Don't do that. Otherwise, they would truly understand and hear Jesus and truly believe in him. Number two, daily feast on Jesus. Daily feast. So not only do we accept Christ and we're, we feast on him at the moment of our salvation, the moment we choose, yes, Jesus, I want you today as my Savior. And many of us have already done that. We've already put our faith in Christ and we've given our life to him. But once we've done that now, Jesus is living in us and it's a constant daily walk with Christ. Now, some of us, as we daily feast, think of the analogy of food again. A lot of us, I'm a breakfast guy. I like to have a good breakfast. Some of you are like, I skip breakfast or you might have run out the door with a, you know, a power bar. You know, you do it really fast. I like to have a solid breakfast before I get going in the morning. And, and just like we need that food to, to get us going and get us strength. That's how more importantly, we need to dwell and feast on Jesus. So the moment I get out of bed, I say, Lord, today is your day. God, this is your day and I want to live for you. From the moment we get up, we got to turn our mind and our heart upward. I want to feast on you throughout the day. You're more important than food. You are life to me and I need you to guide me and lead me today for your glory. I remember Jesus' words when he's being tempted and Satan, as Jesus is extremely hungry, after fasting for days and days and days and having no food, Jesus said, uh, Satan says, turn these rocks into bread. And Jesus says, Satan, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from God. And so let that be the cry of our heart. More important than material food and all the nice material things that we have around us. If God takes all those things away, I can live on God. I can feast on Him. You know, uh, the adult English group on Friday night has been studying sort of the end times. We've been studying persecution and tribulation. What if... It comes to a point like it's already happening in the persecuted church around the world that our lives, our jobs will be taken away. Maybe our children will be separated from us. Can we say, I've got Jesus, the bread of life. He will sustain me. He's working all things for good. Is he my desire? Does he fulfill every appetite? Can we say, Lord, I know Jesus alone fulfills every appetite I have every good appetite. He is God and He loves us. That Jesus, if you do sometime take away my life and, and, and things around me, if you took away everything, you put me in prison or I was tortured for my faith, I would say I will trust in Jesus because He's already won. He's paid for my sins and won my victory. That's the encouragement for us today is the daily feast on Christ. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, as we think about you, Lord, you give us these wonderful pictures when you talk to us about yourself, sometimes in parables and in these analogies that we get a better understanding of who you are. You are food and drink to us, more important than, than physical food. You are very life that we need to sort of ingest you and and uh, and put you into ourselves every day. Not not that we can do that, Lord. We've already done that in Christ when you saved us. But God, to constantly walk in the Spirit, submit to you. It's a daily feasting, meditating, and thinking about who you are and how to glorify you today. Lord, help us humbly submit to you. Continue to work in our hearts. Nourish us. God, give us your strength. Lord, we love you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
All right, let's um, come back together again and sing this last song, uh, Be Thou My Vision. <clears throat>
Hi, this is Dad. My wife Leah and I are serving in a mission organization called Pioneer PI, and there's a base in Asia called PIA Pioneer in Asia, where we want to evangelize and church plant churches among the unreached people groups, and primarily through the sending of Asian missionary to these Asian unreached people groups, and that involves mobilization to mobilize various Christian and churches. We will travel to various Asian country to train whether it's congregation, leaders, even pastors, how to be more involved in missions, to praying, to giving. And some will end up wanting to go. So for these pre-missionary, we will also train them, train them whether it's biblically, spiritually, emotionally, and also very importantly, um, culturally. We also do caring work to care for them and sometimes, if necessary, counseling. And there are also time left that we might go to these unreached people group and we also do evangelistic work and they are also work in the local area. So at this time, we want to take opportunity to thank all of you for caring, praying, and loving us. We appreciate it. We know the Great Commission is indeed great and need all of us to get involved. If any one of you want to know more, to be involved in a specific way, please be in touch with us. Thank you, and God bless you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we lift up Pastor Dot and Leah to you, God, to strengthen them as they, in turbulent times with the pandemic, Lord, they're, they're back home here, not knowing when they'll go back. But God, you've ordained all these things. Strengthen them, strengthen their hearts during this time, uh, Lord, and just prepare wherever you want them as they go next and whatever time you have for the mission work to open up again. And God, that you would use them. God, you would use their work to impact lives for your kingdom, God. God, you are our vision. You satisfy every soul that we have. God, you are our bread of life. Help us keep our eyes always fixed on you. And God, you will lead us. You're inside of us. You're indwelling us. And God, just, just lead us to glorify your name, God, forever and ever, Lord. We love you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.